Good morning. It's time to begin our Sunday morning worship service. We're glad to have everyone, everyone out with us this morning. If you're visiting, please take just a moment to fill out one of the blue visitor's cards. In just a moment, we'll have the ushers come around and pick those up. We'll be meeting again this evening at 5 o'clock and then Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for midweek Bible study. So please join us at every opportunity that you have. On the sick list, continue to remember Totsy Sanders. And good to see Mr. Emmett Sanders with us today. Kenneth Osmer's with us. Miss Ruby Wilburn. Uh, Libby Orbison's back with us. So we have several that are back. But uh, continue to remember uh, a Totsy who is at home. Tonight, after services, we'll have our graduation appreciation dinner. That's going to be honoring all of our high school and college graduates. So if you want to attend that, please bring a covered dish and stay for that activity. The monthly meeting of the Ladies Helping Hands will be Thursday, May 31st at 10 o'clock at the home of Joy Marshall. Would the ushers pick up any visitors cards that we have? Just a quick update on our Honduras trip. We have reached our goal to raise enough money to build four houses. Thank you for everyone who contributed. The next phase of this will be to uh, check the list in the foyer for medicine and clothing because there are several items that are still needed. Our opening song this morning is number 583, 583. Tim Orbison will be speaking this morning. Our closing prayer will be led by Brian Norris. We'll start this morning with a prayer by Seth Bowen. Will you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this opportunity this morning. Father, we, we know that we are blessed beyond measure. And Father, just to be here this morning, to be in your presence, and to understand what that means. And Father, there's no way that we could count all the things that you've done for us. There's no way to tell you how great you are. But Father, you truly are a great and awesome God, and we thank you for loving us. We're most important... Most importantly, we're thankful for your son and you sending him to give us an opportunity to be with you one day. And Father, we pray that that may be our focus, that may be our goal, that that's what we're striving to do, so one day to be with you. Father, we're thankful for this group here at Maysville. We're thankful for each member. Father, we pray that you will be with each one of us and help us through the things that we're going through, through our lives, through the struggles, through the good times. And Father, help us to know that you're always there for us, that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. Father, we're mindful of some that are sick. Brother Totsi, is, he's still at home. And we pray that you will be with him and it be your will to restore his health, to get us back back here with us father we're thankful for those that are are back here today and we're thankful for for them and what they mean to us here and we're thankful for their health coming back father we're thankful for the ministers that we have here for tim and lonnie for the work that they do and the time and the preparation that they put into preaching the gospel Father, we're thankful for their stand for the truth and their love for, for your word. And Father, we pray that they may have many years of service here and that you will continue to bless them and their families. And Father, help us to also have that love for the truth. That no matter what comes our way, that nothing is going to separate us from following your will. Father, we're thankful for this country that we live in. We're thankful for the freedoms that we have, the freedom this morning to come and assemble. And Father, we know that men and women have, have bled and died for that freedom and are still fighting for that freedom. Father, we pray that you be with them throughout the world, that the world may be a better place, that, that peace may be through regions where it has never been before. And that, Father, the, fu the future of those areas that the gospel may go and that people can hear your word. Father, we pray that you continue to be with us in our work here at Maysville. And we pray that you will help us to continue to try to do the things that are right to be a shining light to this community. But Father, we pray that you will bless our areas in, in, 
in the mission field and the work that we support. Father, as the group heads to Honduras in a couple of couple of weeks ahead, that, that you will be with them and help their work. And Father, we just pray that, that those souls that are hungry for the gospel may find it. Father, again, we're thankful for you loving us, for you being our Father and allowing us to be your children. We pray that as we enter this hour of worship, that we may worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing to me, O heaven, sing the song of peace from the toys that I mean will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so child with all Sixty-five, three hundred sixty-five. <clears throat> the first and the fourth stanzas, please, of three sixty-five. Jesus, love of my soul, let me tell I was on fly. Oh uh-huh. 
number 511, 511. We'll sing the second and third stanzas. If we think about the cross and what it means to us, we realize a great price was paid there and Jesus giving himself totally for us. Before we partake of his supper, let's sing the second and third stanzas. <coughs> May we keep in memory Pray together. Father, as we gather around this table, help our minds to go back to the time of the suffering and death of our Savior. Help us to see the nails being driven into his hands and feet. Crown of thorns forced upon his head. For him to hang between heaven and earth, suffering for us. Help us, Father, as we partake of this loaf which represents his body as it hung on the cross. That we might realize what he's done for us. Help us partake in such a manner that it would be pleasing in our sight. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we come before you again, thanking you for this day of illness. Lord, we ask you as we take this cup that represents the blood that your Son shed on the cross, that we take it in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. In your Son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Five hundred eleven again. We'll sing the first stanza of this hymn now as we are about to give back to God. Uh, God doesn't need anything from us in a way. He's, he's, he can handle himself and take care of everything. He made the world. But giving back to him is part of our worship today because it demonstrates our love and appreciation for the church that his son gave himself for and for the furtherance of that kingdom and to demonstrate our love for what God does for us on a daily basis. So uh, we give according to New Testament example and inference in that manner, and I hope you'll do that this morning. Sing the first stanza before we do it. <clears throat> oh, if we come together, oh, if we sing and Father in heaven, we uh, thank you for the countless blessings that you have provided for us in our lives, both spiritual and material as well. We focus our minds this time on the needs of others, the needs of our church, the needs for our mission of our missionaries and others that need help. By giving generously to you, may everyone do so this morning with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Please mark number 356, 356, and we'll use that to encourage after our lesson. And now number 800, number 800. The first and the last of this. If you'd like to, please stand and we'll sing it together, number 800. <clears throat> Zion's call sweetly rings over the land and seeping us. Look to rams above while the light from the throne shines for you. some things you say regularly, but you mean them. It's hard as they get said over and over again, sometimes to be appreciated for sincerity, but we're glad that you're here. We appreciate you coming, both of our members and also our visitors. We do want to meet you. We want to welcome you to our services, and if we can help you in any way, we would want to know that as well. I read a statistic this last week that estimated that the people who have died in all wars since about 3000 BC number approximately 3.3 billion people. Coming to that number is impossibly complex. There are hundreds of variables. There's no way for us to know how many wars have been fought throughout the history of the world. And the statisticians and the historians who undertook this project acknowledged that there were lots and lots of variables that they had to, to use in the calculation um, based on known figures and then projecting and, and extrapolating that back to other cultures and things. But regardless of the numbers, wh whether or not those numbers are accurate or not, it is impossible to imagine all of the tragedy and suffering of so many violent deaths in the history of our world. It is especially hard to imagine such violence and terrible treatment of humanity while we're in a place like we are, where we are seated comfortably, where we are surrounded with friends and family, where we have such safety. But if we add on top of all of those who may have died, If we add to that the concept of all the people in the, in the human race who have heaped upon one another hatred 
and animosity and jealousy and envy and scorn and ridicule. Some have described the inhumanity of man to man. And that makes it that much grander or greater a scale of the harsh treatment that have done to human beings. But in contrast to that, in contrast to a world where there's, it is filled with hatred and hurt, imagine a world, if you can do so, imagine the paradise or the virtual paradise that would exist if every person on the face of this earth loved their neighbor. What kind of world would this be? It would be impossible to have a war if you loved your neighbor. It would be impossible to do some of the hurts and the harms to one another if we loved our neighbor. Just, just that one attitude, what would it do to change our world? I want to read from Luke chapter 10. Verse 25 and following. And I think you may know or you may think you know where I'm going with this lesson, but I assure you, you don't. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? If we didn't have the text of Scripture, and if we didn't know Luke chapter 10 so intimately, we might have expected when this lawyer asked this question, who is my neighbor, and challenged Jesus for the theological interpretation now, or the life application of this, we might have expected Jesus then to give a list of qualities or criteria by which we would identify our neighbor. But we don't have a list. Jesus doesn't give us a lot of, of ifs. If this condition or if that condition or, or if whatever. There's no description of, of how one might go about defining neighbor. Instead, Jesus just tells a story. And oh, you know that story so well. Of the man who was traveling and fell among thieves and was left beaten and dead, robbed. And along come some who could help him, but do not. And finally one comes by that does. And Jesus says, go do like that. I read a story uh, from a Mr. D.B. Towner, who traveled with the very famous Dwight L. Moody, who was a evangelical preacher back in the uh, late 1800s, uh, founded the Moody Bible Institute. But the story that he wrote is very interesting, and I want to read it, at least part of it. Now, this is Mr. Towner traveling with, with Mr. Moody. After his meetings in Oakland, California in the spring of 1899, when I accompanied him as a singer, we took the train for Santa Cruz. We were hardly seated when in came a party of young men, one of whom was considerably under the influence of liquor 
and very badly bruised, with one eye completely closed and terribly discolored. He at once recognized Mr. Moody and began to sing hymns and talk very loudly for his benefit. Moody caught up his bag and said, Towner, let's get out of this. When I reminded him that the other car was full, he settled back down, protesting that the company should not allow a drunken man to insult the whole car in such a manner. Presently the conductor came, and Mr. Moody called his attention to the poor fellow in the rear of the car. The conductor attended to his duty, and when he reached the young man, he said a few words to him in a low voice, and the fellow followed him into the baggage car, where the conductor bathed his eye and bound it up with his own handkerchief after which the young man soon fell asleep. Mr. Moody sat musing for a time, then said, Towner, that is an awful rebuke to me. I preached against Phariseeism last night to a crowd and exhorted them to imitate the Good Samaritan. And now this morning... God has given me an opportunity to practice what I preached, and I find I have both feet in the shoes of the priest and Levite. He continues, He was reticent all the way to Santa Cruz, but he told the incident that night to the audience, confessing his humiliation. Jesus demonstrated in his life and in his teachings his concern for humanity. It doesn't take much to find statements of that sort. Let's do a little more reading. Back to Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus looked back to the prophecy made by Isaiah, and he said, Isaiah spoke about the nature of the coming of the Messiah, that the Messiah would be one who came to allow people to be free. The Messiah would come to take care of others. The Messiah would come as a helper, not a hindrance. And when we find the words of Jesus Wherever we find words either about him or from him, he is involved in the care of other people. With perhaps one or two exceptions, where Jesus was driving out a group of people who had turned the temple into a place of corruption. All the interaction that Jesus had with others is of exceptional kindness. And even here, it was not inappropriate action that Jesus did, but was a necessary step. But as we read through the words of Jesus, not only how he acted toward others, but how he encouraged, if that's the appropriate terminology, perhaps that's a little, little weak, how that he demanded 
that those who were going to be his disciples act in the same way. From Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you, persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, since rain on the just and on the unjust. If you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? You see, as Jesus looked around the world, he said, our treatment of others must not be dependent on how they treated us. But instead, our treatment of others is dependent on how we see them and how we see ourselves. When struggling with the question of, of power, of position, Jesus dealt with his own disciples in Matthew chapter 20 with these words, beginning in verse 25. Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Those words sting us, don't they? I wonder... why we're not kinder than we are. How much the world needs it. How easily it is done to be kind instead of harsh. How long is it it is remembered when someone does a kindness to you? I want you to listen to these verses. I'm going to read from the New Revised Standard Version. I don't have that Bible, so I have had to write those words in my notes. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. You know those words even in that translation from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In Paul's great discussion of love. Not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, does not insist on its own way, is not irritable or resentful. That's what love is. That's how Paul described love there. And then he would go on to the Thessalonians and would talk about, or the Corinthians rather, and talk about his, his affection for them and, and how he was willing to be uh, changed for them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 14 and 15, he says, I do not want what is yours, but you. I will most gladly... Spend and be spent for you. When Paul looked at them in his world, he said, I don't want your stuff. I don't want you to give me anything. I want to do something for you. I want to use myself up in your service. That's love. 
Now, we could go and look to the Scriptures and we could find that clearly God, that Jesus expects for us to provide for in some of the physical ways that, that, that people have need. In Matthew chapter 25, as Jesus describes the judgment scene in the last day, and the story there as it unfolds, as the nations are gathered and they are divided, as a shepherd would divide the sheep and the goats, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and those who are ushered into the Father's kingdom are those who have clothed the naked, have fed the hungry, have given drink to the thirsty, have helped those who were sick, have visited those who were in prison, and taken in those who were strangers and had no place. Clearly, Jesus expected a physical response of his people. The story of the Good Samaritan teaches that idea. In Galatians chapter 6 and the 10th verse, Paul said, Let us, as much as we have opportunity, do good to all men. Now we have to pause there. Immediately some will go on and read the rest of that verse where Paul says, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. But we've got to pause and for a moment and, and understand that Paul was describing our responsibility to everyone, not just Christians. To Christians we have an additional responsibility, but we have a responsibility to all. But we also have a responsibility that is spiritual. And we've discussed it recently uh, a considerable amount. We could go to the Gospels and look to what we would describe as the, the uh, Great Commission and see the words of Jesus, go into all the world to preach the Gospel to every creature, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit. We understand that we have a requirement, a responsibility to carry the message of the Gospel to the world. But we also have a responsibility not only to provide for physical things and not only to provide for the spiritual uplift and message of the gospel that the world needs. We also have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters who are in the Lord. We have a responsibility to one another. We have several of them, actually. I want to read a text from the book of Philippians, excuse me, the book of Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to start reading in the 8th verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 and following. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And now watch verse 11. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you were doing. We have a responsibility to both, to both provide for comfort and edification of our own brethren. And those are left perhaps somewhat ambiguous. Paul will describe in Romans chapter 14, verse 19, Let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify one another. When we love our fellow man and our neighbor enough, we will feed him when he's hungry. We will preach the gospel to him when he is lost. And we'll edify when he's a brother. But there's one other category that we've got to discuss this morning. There's one more place where we need to prove our love and concern. And it is an area where I believe as a whole we are woefully negligent. And that is our response toward our brethren who grow weak and inactive and fall into sin. 
I want to read from the book of Hebrews chapter 10. The passage that we would most commonly go to to use to describe the need to attend worship services, Hebrews chapter 10, 25, is set into a context that begins far before this verse. And while I don't have time this morning to go and set the ultimate context of what's taking place in the book of Hebrews and the better covenant that, that is, the writer describes, and that is through Jesus, and then finally as we come boldly before the throne of grace to God. But just pick up in the 24th verse. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. There is a responsibility for us to help those who attend to worship. And when we gather together like we are now, we edify each other. We strengthen each other. In fact, we have a responsibility to stir up unto love and to good works. One of the responsibilities that we have as Christians when we gather together is to interact with one another so that we help and encourage and comfort and edify to do a better job. But what about the missing? What about those who are not here? It is not possible for any one of us where you're seated right now and the knowledge that you have, the information you have, for you to be aware of every one of the members of the congregation of the Maysville Church that should be here that is not. Not where, you're, not where you are right now. There's no way for you to know everyone who is missing. But do you know what you can know? Equally as confident as I am that no one could know everyone who is missing, I am confident that every one of us can identify someone who is missing this morning. There is some friend... There is some fellow pew mate. There is someone who sits near you. There is some family member. There is someone in your Bible class, someone in your service team. There is someone in your circle of influence and your group of friends that you know this morning is not here at worship. And you may know something about their whereabouts, or you may not. I don't know what our count is this morning, but imagine the impact on our local congregation if every one of us this morning went to our homes and made one phone call to one person who is not in attendance today. Do you have time to make one phone call this afternoon? I know you're busy. You probably have a whole schedule of things that you're planning to do. In fact, you're, you may be in, in a hurry and even anxious to get away. You may be thinking, yeah, we're going to be late to the, uh, to the cafeteria right now. Everybody's going to be in front of us. And then when I get home, I've got uh, this to do, and then I've got whatever to do, and you've got your schedule all laid out. You don't have time to make one phone call to a brother or a sister in the Lord and say, how are you? I missed you. Yeah, you do. And I do too. I don't know whether we'll take the time this afternoon to make that call, but I know we've got the time. And if you look around, 
It only takes you a minute to get someone in mind. Sometimes we know they're missing. We may or may not know if they're in spiritual trouble of some kind. Maybe their heart's been broken. Maybe they've been discouraged. Maybe they're they're struggling with some spiritual problem or a physical problem or a problem with people. Maybe some issue has come up that's separated them and and they're upset by something or, or whatever. There, there may be a variety of things that would come up in life. But rather than go on with our speculation, I would like to read three passages of Scripture with fairly minimal comment, and then we'll be through. The first is in the book of Galatians, chapter 6. I could quote some of these, but it's more important that we read them together. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. I only want to make one observation regarding this verse. There's many more that can be made, but I'll limit my comments to one. This verse only applies to those who are spiritual. If you're not a spiritual person, Paul isn't talking to you. If you don't have a concern for the spiritual well-being of a brother or sister in Christ, you're not being identified. But if you're spiritual, consider those who are around you. The second passage is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We were close a while ago. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil, but always... Pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. And our final passage is from the book of James, chapter 5, beginning in the 19th verse. James five nineteen. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And he, willing to justify himself, said, And who is my neighbor? I think there are lots of us who could probably put some images together where we would see someone in need that we would be willing to reach out and help. But the question is not, can we imagine a scenario in which we would act to help others? The question is rather, in the situations where we find ourselves in life, will we act to do the will of God, even to our brethren? Who is my neighbor?
The words of the Lord were not intended to fill up scripture. They were intended to fill our hearts. And when they fill our hearts, those words will show themselves in actions toward one another. The lesson is yours. This morning, it may be that you're not a Christian. You've never been obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you something about your life. Without Christ, you'll be lost. When the day comes that you stand before God, you'll still be in your sins. God will not enjoy sending you away from his home and habitation, but he will do so. Because he has promised that those who are not washed in the blood of Jesus, those who do not have their sins forgiven, will not spend eternity in his home, but will instead be ushered into the place where the devil and his angels will spend eternity. But he wants you to come. He wants you to be forgiven. He wants you to find and follow his son. He has paid the price for your sins. Jesus suffered and died on the cross. Through his stripes we are healed. By his blood we are forgiven. God calls on us to make an obedient response. To believe that testimony of Jesus Christ. To change our lives in repentance. To make that good confession before men that we believe Jesus is God's son. And then to be baptized in water for the remission of sins. Rising from that watery grave as a new person ready to serve the Lord and to serve the Lord of glory. It may be that you're a child of God today, but you have forgotten. You've allowed because of the world or busyness or things around you just how much the Lord needs you to serve faithfully. And you recognize in your own life a need to change and become closer to the model of Jesus, maybe in a public way. Whatever your need is this morning, if you have a spiritual need, that needs to be taken care of in a public way. We invite you to come now as we stand and as we sing. Jesus is him 499 <clears throat> have our services this evening I hope you'll be back then it'll be at five o'clock we'll have our graduation uh, ceremony uh, festivities after that stick around for that if you'd like to Tim will be away this evening he's a guest speaker over in the Plasky area but we have some guest speakers in his stead so we'll leave you to figure that out when you get here tonight have our closing prayer and again if you're visiting with us um, come back 
even tonight if you can or any other time in the future. We'll do the first and the second stanzas, please. <clears throat> oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my nothing before you but you give us the opportunity to come before you as children help us to always live with that calling in mind and help draw us close back to you as we so often wander away we live in a country of great blessing teach us humility and our wealth help us to Look always to you, the Father of all blessings. In our wisdom, help us to always see you in all things. In our righteousness, help us to remember all the things that you've given, forgiven us of. In our popularity, help us to seek only to please you. Father, as we leave this place, help our love of you and our love of those around us to always guide us. Help us to bring those who don't know you to understand you and to love, uh, love you as we do. And help us to encourage those of our number who we know aren't with us. Many things can draw people away, but we know that the greatest thing that they need is your love, and we can show that to them. In your son's holy and precious name, amen.